want to talk a little bit about um, about something that you have experienced um, eight thousand times, probably, especially if you have some difficult people to deal with. Um, it is rare that difficult people do not have this dynamic operating in their heads. And it's also uh, rare that humans don't have this operating in our heads in a sense, because we really need it to survive in a way. <laughs> so what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about something for lack of a better word today, we will call it confirmation bias confirmation bias and what that basically means is that we have a tendency to engage with the world um, with our existing ways of seeing the world right we make maps of the world this is how it works that's the way i get to the that's the way i get to the refrigerator every morning if i didn't have a map of how to get there i would be every day be Groundhog Day, right? I'd be trying to figure out anew every day. Well, I kind of have had some experiences and they built a way of seeing the world and I kind of operate according to that world. Well, that's kind of normal. That's how we're wired, right? Well, here's the thing. We have beliefs and we have attitudes and we have paradigms and we have maps and we have philosophies and strongly tied to those are emotions. And this goes into how we see the world. It also goes into probably a little more relevant maybe today in this discussion, it goes into how we see each other, okay? Now this can be a really good thing because what confirmation bias does is we tend to look at the world from a particular perspective and we're going to interpret data to confirm our perspective. Now that's a little bit problematic, right? Because what that says is whatever I see, I'm going to somehow have a tendency possibly to use that information to confirm what I was talking about or what I believe, sorry. So for example, you've got a conflict um, with a family member and that family member thinks that you don't really care about them. All you care about is yourself, right? Okay, let's say that's not true at all, at all, not true at all. But that's what they believe about you. So this family member, let's say they go talk to their shrink, all right? And they talk to their shrink and they say, the shrink says, well, why don't you reach out to them? Why don't you reach out to your sister, your brother, or your mom or dad or uncle or aunt Sally or the strange friend at the church, all right? Whoever this is, family member or not. And, but they think, you only care about yourself, but their shrink talks them into give it another try. Be humble, humble yourself, go over there, you know, call them, reach out. All right, so all that's happening on this side of the fence, right? Well, over here, let's say they don't even know it. You've been for two days preparing, making stuff, making food, collecting sleeping bags and toys and all of this, because this particular morning, you're gonna go down to the church or the homeless shelter and you're gonna volunteer and you've been looking forward to this and you're planning on it. They don't know this, right? Okay. So they decide this is the day that they're gonna reach out to you and show them, show you that they want to make this relationship work. So they knock on your door, they surprise you. What a nice thing to do. They knock on your door and they surprise you. And you open the door and you say, well, hey, how are you? Come on in. They say, well, I, I, 
what I wanted to do is I dropped by because I want to take you to brunch. We hadn't visited in a while and, you know, I know we've had some troubles and I want to take you out to, I want to take you out to brunch. And you say, oh gosh, you know, well, I, I'd like to, I, I can't go today. I've got some plans. Instantly, what does confirmation bias do? It says, I knew it. I knew it. They only care about themselves. Here I make all this effort and they only care about themselves. Well, fine. Okay, if that's what you want to be, then fine. I knew my shrink was wrong, right? They slam the door and they leave. They go back to the shrink. Well, I tried, but all they care about is their own schedule. Not true at all. But there was an event that got filtered and used in that person's head to confirm what they already feel, right? And you're done. I mean, end of reconciliation process. And I have seen this 80,000 gazillion times. 80,000 gazillion times. You want to see it. You want to really see it in action. Here's what you do. I'm not going to mention networks. But you don't even have to have a network. You can have two friends. <laughs> Two friends from opposite sides of the political spectrum, but it's fun. What I like to do as a psychologist is, is I like to put, you know, <laughs> get the two networks side by side and, oh, I wish I could mention names of on both sides of the world that it, the last thing they had was a thought. All they have is confirmation bias. And I see this in my friends from both sides of the political spectrum, the religious world, you know, the whole bit. You will have a, a piece of data that comes out, a piece of news, if you could find that, right? That's literal data without it being interpreted. But let's say there is a number that gets posted of something. And to hear each side use that to confirm and prove why the other side is bad or wrong that's a great example of confirmation bias if you just want to study it you can see it in families if you look at you got two two warring parties in your extended family and listen to them talk about the other one and they just whatever it is it just proves well you know what they're, they're No, there's such little ability to suspend judgment that they never can learn what's going on. Give you a simply another simple example. I'm sitting on an airplane one day, and every now and then I screw up and tell the person, you know, when they ask, "What do you do?" Sitting next to you, and you know, don't ever say you're a psychologist if you want to be able to read a book or a magazine or you know, watch a movie on an airplane. Because as soon as you say you're a psychologist, hey, try this. Just just go tell somebody you're a psychologist. Because <laughs> the next thing you're going to hear is, oh, I got to tell you about my mother. Oh, my gosh. I got to tell you about. Because everybody's got something, right, that we need to talk about. And I don't fault people for that. I'm just saying sometimes I like a little, little peace and quiet on an airplane. So I'd say I'm a consultant. Anyway, one day I'm uh, off my game a little bit and I slipped, said I'm a psychologist. And at that moment, though, things changed for me because I saw the pain in his eyes. Um, I saw this, this man um, and you could see his expression change. He said, you know, I, I've, I probably need to go talk to a psychologist about my daughter and me. I said, what's happening? And you could tell he was troubled by it. And he said, well, you know, she's a teenager and um, just having a lot of trouble with, you know, rebelliousness. And I said, well, what kind of rebellion? He mentioned, you know, a few things that she was kind of acting out in some ways. And, and, and he, you could tell he was, he was really hurt by it and cared about her, no doubt about it. 
And I said, I said, well, um, you know, what have you tried? What have you done? And he was talking about, well, you know, teenagers are just rebellious. So we have to set down some pretty clear, and he used the word boundaries, pretty clear boundaries and enforce those because that's how teenagers are. You know, they're just rebellious. And as he was talking about this, you could tell he was getting a little more, a little less soft, a little more, eh, 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 you know, kind of in his voice. And he kept saying this line, you know, you have to because teenagers are rebellious. And I could hear the confirmation bias that his belief system was any behavior by a teenager was that didn't fit, right, was interpreted as rebellion. And so rebellion by nature must be snuffed out, right? And so I said, well, what kind of stuff did it? And she, he started to list stuff that she would do. And he said, see, you know, that's rebellion or rebellion, rebellion. You got it. And so I said, um, I said, so what do you think's driving that, that behavior? He goes, well, it's rebellion. That's what teenagers do. I said, well, not always. I mean, sometimes acting out can be a cry for help. Sometimes acting out can be an attempt to, regain some autonomy and choice that they don't have. Sometimes acting out can be an attempt to find somebody to listen to them that they're not finding at home. Sometimes acting out can be an attempt at curiosity and trying to learn. Sometimes it can be an attempt to engage a peer group. Some, and I listed six or eight different things that some of that behavior could be in addition to overt rebellion, which obviously that's a possibility too. Totally, I believe in that, that it exists, yeah. In fact, really the teenage years are an overthrow of the government and it's much better to do that in, you know, with the peace accord and do a treaty than it is have to have a coup or a war, but it's gonna happen, that's the way it's designed. They're supposed to take over authority by the time they're 18 ish 20 it's not like that probably 20 is a good number anyway he just interpreted everything in his view and he said well what do you mean i said well maybe she's hurting he said well i don't know if she's hurting or not but she shouldn't be acting that way and i said well what have you done to try to sit down with her and find out what she might be hurting about. He said, well, like what? And I said, have you asked her what it's like to be your daughter? What it's like to be on the other side of you? What that feels like? What kind of some of the struggles are? Or have you asked her, what's it like to be a 15 year old in her school? What's the peer constellation there how's that work how do clicks work is she in or out is she being bullied is she a bully i don't know i don't know her but have you tried to understand her world and you could tell he just never considered that there might be some realities that he doesn't really understand that might go into an understanding of the world that's larger than the understanding that he has. And that's confirmation bias. And it keeps us, it really keeps us stuck. It really, really keeps us stuck because we have our views of things. And obviously nobody's omniscient at all. People have these fixed views that keep them, just keep them stuck. I, and how are we doing on time here? We probably got to get some calls. I'll tell you one quick story. Um, of kind of, Cause I see this in the business world a lot. You know, I, most of, a lot of my work, most of my work is, is in, you know, consulting with companies and CEOs and teams and stuff like that from the, you know, kind of where human functioning and business come together. Um, as you know, you guys have bosses, you know what that looks like. 
It's so interesting. You know, a lot of times, even when I tell people that, um, you know, I work on, on leadership development with CEOs and, and their, you know, their teams and the company cultures. And, and it's so, it's so interesting how often somebody will immediately say, Oh well, yeah, you, you know how those CEOs are. They don't care about anything but money. And I just want to throw up because <laughs> I work with so many of them and am tied to networks of thousands and thousands and thousands of really good businesses that really care about their employees and spend gazillions of dollars to develop them and help them. And there are some bad ones too that try to, you know, really hurt workers and exploit them and all that. Of course there are, but we don't know who we're dealing with until we give up our confirmation biases and ask, who am I dealing with here? So we can have that view about a lot of things. A lot of people have a thing about, about faith. You know, I talk to people about Faith and they go, oh, you know, I, you know how those Christians are, they're all a bunch of damn hypocrites. You know, I've talked to them, I've seen them. I tried to go one time and they and they walk into church and they say, after all these years, I'm gonna go back and try. And they walk in and the greeter gets distracted and doesn't talk. See, they don't care about anybody. I bet they're gonna be handing out the plate, asking for money right now. You watch them. Confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. It happens in the other direction too. You know, people have, uh, a lot of times you'll see these rigid Christians that like, if people don't come from their view of faith, confirmation bias, but everything they do is, is bad and conspiratorial and evil and awful and all this. And they, they really don't know. It's a bad thing we do, people, and when we use data to confirm our views of the world it's not a good thing anyway i was going to tell you a story but it's, i've gone on too long i'll tell you another day about it so watch yourself and your assumptions today as you go interact with somebody they may not be as bad as you think they are okay maybe not